whole thing, just simply because I want to emphasize what we'll be looking at. I want you to stand, if you would, for the reading of the Word. It's a very, very familiar passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to start in verse 13. Matthew 16, starting in verse 13. So follow along with me. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man am? Verse. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for, Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I pray also unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's it. I want us to just one more time ask the Lord to bless it. Father, hide me behind the cross. Let every word that I say be from you. Let my thoughts be your thoughts. Let my words be your words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. It was probably a... Thanks. Did you already drink out of it? That's okay. No problem. Is mine gone? I don't know where mine went. Oh, no, this one's yours. <laughs> Is this mine? Uh, if anybody knows me, I don't like drinking after people. So anyway, I want to talk to you tonight about this thought. Upon this rock, upon this rock, many people have attempted this. And they have preached it many a times, and I don't claim to put anything new or any new spin to it. What I do claim to do is try to preach what I feel like the Lord has laid upon my heart in this passage. We build a lot of things. Um, I remember when I was in Fayetteville. I didn't say I built a house, but we went into that home and we began to redesign it. And we began to do different things to that property we we changed the flooring, we changed the, the walls, we changed the bathroom. Believe it or not, I put a, a, a shower in there. I mean, we, we did things that we were not used to doing. Um, the other day in Greenwood, a, a, a funeral home that had just been built was struck by lightning. And because of that, they had to tear the whole thing down to the slab. All it is is a um, parking lot and a slab. And upon that slab, their plans were to build a new funeral home. Plans have changed, but upon that slab and that foundation, that's where they were going to build that funeral home. Every good home has a good foundation. If you don't, you will begin to see the walls shifting. You'll see the cinder block or the sheetrock begin to crack. In Roanoke Rapids, where I pastored, there was a, a, a very... Um, uh, an unsettling foundation and so the the gym would begin to shift and the walls would begin to crack and over time if they don't fix it it will even get worse and for the sanctuary they had to go and hire Ramjack I believe that's what the company is called and it would go down to a certain level in the soil and try to stabilize the foundation because of what it was built upon. Jesus speaking and preaching about foundations, he said that the person that hears his words was a wise man. That he would be like a wise man that built his house upon what? A rock. But if you didn't hear his words, you would be a foolish man. That you would build that house upon the sand. And when the wind and the waves and the storms of life would blow against that home, the home would not stand because of what it had been built upon. What you build your life upon is key. In this passage, Jesus has a moment with his disciples that all of us would love to be a part of. 
It is a time where they are intimate. They are, it's a, it's a very um, small setting and Jesus just begins to talk to them. He begins to lay out some questions to them. And the first thing that Jesus says is, who do men say that I am? And in this moment, they begin to go down a litany or a list of names and ideas and philosophies. But I want to talk to you just for a moment about that question, who do men say that I am? Because when you look at men and you look at this world that we're in, you see that the religious people even have a view about Jesus. For the Jew, he is the son of Mary. He is a good man and a teacher, but he is not the one that is prophesied about in Malachi. For the Mormon, he is one God among many. He is a spirit brother of even the devil you can read in some of the studies that I found. For the Jehovah Witness, he's an archangel like Michael. For the New Age, he is a divine avatar. For the Muslim, for the Hindu, for the world, they all have an idea of who Jesus is. For a man in this world, when you mention Jesus Christ, he is a religious figure. Jesus is a good man that said good things. Jesus is in the same category as Muhammad or Buddha or the great cosmos. And with the disciples, their response was similar. They said, some say that you are John the Baptist. Some say that you are the prophet Elijah coming back. Some say that you are the weeping prophet, prophet Jeremiah. And others say that you are another prophet. But Jesus doesn't want to hear what the world says. Jesus looks at them and says this. Jesus says, I understand what they say, but I want to know what you say. Because see, when the rubber meets the road, we all want to know what each other are thinking. When you are in a setting of one-on-one and you are trying to talk with somebody and and kind of figure out what's going on. You don't want to hear what everybody else is saying, no. You want to hear what they are saying. In fact, you want to have a moment of personal inquiry because it's okay to know if me and Odell are talking that everything else that everybody is saying, but if I want to know with Brother Odell some things, then I want to know what his opinion is. And in this moment, Jesus looks at his disciples that he has walked with, that he's ministered to, and he says this. He says, I understand what they say, but I want to know what do you say. Because, see, we all are going to have to one day give an account before a mighty God. We are all, according to the book of Philippians, says that we are all going to have to work out our own salvation. That we are all going to have to answer to an almighty God about what our decision is when it comes to Jesus Christ. He says, who do you say that I am? And so here is this loud mouth Simon Peter. He stands up and He just begins to belt out something and it's found right here in this passage of scripture. Simon Peter says right here in verse 16, he says, You are the Son of God. You are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Now when you look at this, you understand what he's saying. He's saying that you are the Christos. Now, I'm going to get a little bit deeper than this. I'm trying to lay a foundation. He says, you are the anointed one. This is a name that is applied to Jesus by early Greek-speaking Christians. It is a translation of the Hebrew word, um, anointed one, Mashiach, of the Messiah they would talk about. Yeshua was a translation of the Hebrew name Joshua, but it was to thought, It was to bring thought to Jesus when we hear that name. In fact, it is the very thing that John 3.16 speaks about when it says that God gave his only begotten son. It is the very crux of the gospel that Jesus is the Yeshua 
Hamashiach. He is the one that the Jewish people have looked forward to and he is the one that we look to as the Savior of the world. And Simon stands up. And Simon says, I know who you are. I know they say you're Jeremiah. I've heard them say that you are Elijah. I've heard them say that you're one of the prophets. But Simon stands up and says, but I know who you are. He doesn't say you're my buddy that goes out on the boat with me. He doesn't say you're my, you're my friend that, that went over and prayed for my mother-in-law. He didn't say you're, you're the one that I gave up fishing for. No. He said, you are the very son of the living God. Because see, today, if Jesus is not that, then we might as well just close up shop, go home, and just do whatever we want to. In fact, Paul said it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, if the resurrection has not been accomplished, then everything we do is in vain. But because he is risen from the grave, he is victorious, and at the right hand of the Father, he is the Son of God. And he said, you are the son of God. And all of a sudden, Peter, in that moment, is revealed by the spirit of God, Jesus said, who he was. And so today, before we move any further, you have to evaluate your opinion of Jesus. Because if you're going to be the church that he is building, you've got to first of all know who he is. He is not a fable. He is not a crutch. He is not a good thought. He is not a spiritual Santa Claus. He is not a fictional character like the tooth fairy. He is not the Easter bunny that shows up with a gift basket. But Jesus is the Son of God who descended on this earth, who lived 33 years, who died on a cross, who went to the grave, who rose from the grave, and now is at the right hand of the Father, church. That's who he is. He is not some made up fiction category that we talk about. He is not some kind of elective like our kids take at school. But he is the only begotten son of God. He is the redeemer of all men. He is the eternal king that Paul writes about in his epistles. He is Jesus Christ our Lord. He looks at him and he says, this is not something that you've gotten by your flesh. He said, this is not something that you can figure out on your own, Peter. He said, this is something that the Spirit of God has revealed unto you. Because, see, if you don't know who Jesus is, you've not allowed the Spirit of God to open up your heart. In fact, when Paul is doing his ministry in the book of Acts, the Bible said that he found a woman, I believe it was Lydia. And the Bible said that when she was selling purple, that she, she, she heard the gospel. And the word says there that the Lord opened up her heart. She didn't begin to follow Paul. She didn't begin to follow Silas. She didn't begin to follow any of the other companions. But the Bible said when her heart was open that she began to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are wrestling today with who Jesus Christ is, I challenge you to allow God to open up your spirit and the Holy Spirit of God will rush in and reveal to you that He is the Savior. He said, flesh and blood's not revealed this, but it's a spiritual thing. And so Jesus begins to change directions and begins to take this moment and seizes this opportunity and begins to speak to them about future plans. Plans that we celebrated today when we celebrate the day of Pentecost. Because it's on that day that the church is initiated in its movement. It is on that day like the 
like the Old Testament celebrates on that feast of weeks that they celebrated the 50th day and they celebrated the time that the Torah was given after they experienced the Passover when they were we were released from Egyptian bondage it was that day on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit descended and they were empowered to go out into all the world and preach the gospel but it's in this moment that Jesus begins to reveal to them what he's doing. Jesus says, who do men say that I am? Peter, he stands up and he says, you are the son of God. And Peter says, this is the moment that I'm taking to declare unto you, Peter, what I am about to do. And he does this. He says, you are Peter. In fact, he says here, he says, you are Petras. He says, you are a name like Rocky, so to speak. It was a surname. It was a a title that Peter would have. And he said, I want to talk to you just for a moment. And before he begins to reveal to him the spiritual revelation, he begins to acknowledge to Peter, I know who you are, as if to say you are a human. You have your own struggles. In fact, Peter, on the day that I am accused or I am turned over because of Judas Iscariot, you are going to deny me three times. You are a human being. You are going to fail. And before we get any further in this message, you understand that you are going to mess up. I hate doing this, but just turn to your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. Might have been a news flash. You're not perfect. You're a mess up sometimes. You're a failure. You're a human. And there is no way in God's creation that he would build something as eternally strong as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ on a man. And so in this moment he says you are a little rock but there is a bigger rock that is bigger than you that I am about to build this church upon and that's the terminology that he uses here. He says you are going to build this church upon a Petra. You are going to build this church upon a rock that cannot be destroyed. In fact, in Psalm 61 it says this about the rock that it is higher than I am. In Psalms 118 and verse 22 it says that he is the stone that has been rejected but now he is the cornerstone. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 4 it says he is the spiritual rock which which we drink out of. It is Jesus Christ that the church shall be built upon. Jesus is looking at him and he's saying unto them, you are not going to see this church built upon neither one of you. Any of you. This church is not going to be built upon your charisma. This church is not going to be built upon your memorization of scripture. This church is not going to be on your ability as a orator or a speaker. But this church is going to be built upon the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you before we go any further. You are not going to build this church. What God is wanting to do in Thorn Church of God is not going to be built upon your name, your money or your prestige but it is going to be built upon the one and only Son of God Jesus Christ my Savior he says upon this rock I will build my church he didn't say that just there in that place he said upon that rock On top of that rock, I will build those that have been called out of darkness. That have been called out of darkness and now have been brought into his marvelous 
light. The people that will carry the gospel. Those that have been saved by grace that go out into the schoolhouse, that go out into the jailhouse, that go out into the workforce and they are carriers of the gospel. Inside of them there is a treasure that cannot be taken away and it has been built upon the rock Christ Jesus. Now there's a couple things That strike me here because I believe every one of us would say today that we want to see a church flourish in Thorn Church of God. Amen. In fact, I've spent just a few moments with your pastor before church. I spent a lot of time with him during the youth camp season and the camp meeting season. And I am very aware of what he wants to see accomplished in this church. I am very aware of what his vision and his goals are for this church. But I'm also aware of his passion and his understanding that says that it cannot be built on anything else than Christ Jesus our Lord. And so upon this rock, the Lord said he would build this mystical thing called the church. This body of Christ that is in complete unity. That is many different parts. That are many different facets. Some are singing soprano. Some are singing alto. Some are singing lead. Some are singing and you might be a little off key. But it doesn't matter. When you come together as a church, you are in complete and total unity. It was not because of their gossiping. It was not because of their text messaging. It wasn't because they had Facebook or Twitter. It was because they were in the upper room and one mind and one accord that the spirit of God fell on the day of Pentecost and the church went into the world and saw souls saved God's wanting to build a church say amen God help me Lord I, I, you know I, I debated on whether or not Tommy's probably going to pick on me after I get done but I debated on whether to just come in here and do something simple but I had to share with you what I believe the Lord's wanting to, 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 to share with his church he's wanting to build a church a called out group of people that is not going after their own emotions or their own goals or their own status but they're wanting to see the drug addict saved they're wanting to see those that are lost saved They've got kids in the they've got kids in the jail. They've got kids in the school that are not saved. They got kids that are out in the world doing whatever they don't know. God's wanting to build a church. And if that church is not built upon one name and one name alone and that is Yeshua Hamashiach the son of God who is arisen with healing in his wings who is now at the right hand of the father making intercession if it's not built on him it will fail. There's a church that God's wanting to build. I want to take you through a couple things that I saw in this. The first thing God's wanting to build a whosoever church. Yeah, I said it. Brother Bobo, would you come stand right there? I'm blessed to see you. Every time I think about a greeter, I think about you. I mean that. Every time. I don't know if he's ever missed a son. Has he missed one since you've been here? One. He's keeping count. You're a blessing. Go on over here just a little bit. God's wanting a whosoever church. Now when I hear that word whosoever, I think about whoever. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, poor, rich, high in society, and the lowest of society. See, Jesus did not say that The Lord had sent him to set up a kingdom that would save just the elite people. It is not a country club. It is not a social gathering. It is not something to where we learn our manners in some kind of cotillion. But it is a place where whosoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. The church that Jesus is built, building is found in John three sixteen when it says, For God 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know the rest of it, that whosoever, the day that we set up some kind of rules and routines and some kind of regulations to say, well, you don't fit the mold. Well, you don't pay enough. Well, you don't have the right kind of clothes on. It's the day that we have not built our church upon the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ because I meet a Savior that's found in the gospel that went down the road and saw a woman that was going to be stoned because she was the lower of society and he just wrote in the sand. But I also see a Savior that found a man by the name of Nicodemus and said, you need to be born again. I see a Savior that heard a man by the name of Barabbas that was saying, thou son of David. And he opened up his blinded eyes. Let me tell you, I see a Savior that goes into the highways, the byways, and the hedges, and he saves whosoever. God help me. Whoever, 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 whoever. Don't matter if they got their clothes at dirt cheap like I do. It don't matter if they got their clothes at Belk. Who, just say whosoever for a moment, please. God help me, whosoever. This community is full of whosoevers and they need to know that there is a church being built right here by Bowles Grocery where I used to eat peanuts and drink Coke on Sunday afternoon but there's still a church going that is built on Jesus Christ that says whosoever calls on the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. Whosoever. The next church I thought about, an empowered church. I need a strong man. Anybody strong? No, you know you're strong. Come on. Actually, you stay right there. Stay, stay right there. I need Drew. Come on, Drew. You strong. This is Drew from Tupelo. Come on. Come on. Go on right over. God is building an empowered church. We celebrated the day of Pentecost, and that is dunamis power. In fact, it gives the image of dynamite. God is not producing, nor does he want to produce, a weak and an anemic church. He wants to produce a church that is strong, that is empowered, that is not barred down by the weights of this world. In fact, the writer says that we should fix our eyes upon Jesus and in doing that we should lay aside every sin and weight that does so easily beset us. Let me tell you, you might be 50 pounds soaking wet or you might be like me. You can't even max your weight on a gym set but let me tell you there is something inside of you that can leap over walls that can tear down walls that can walk through walls and it is the power of the Holy Spirit God is building an empowered church you want to know what kind of church he's building? Jesus showed it when he saw his disciples in the room and they were whimpering and scared about what was going on. We serve a resurrected Savior who has been glorified and there was not a wall, there was not a barrier that could keep them out of his presence. He didn't just knock on the door. He tore the door down by walking through the door and he said, peace be unto you. An empowered church. A church that is lifted up above the cares of this world. A church that is able to go into this world and lay aside weights and tear down chains and begin to go through barriers and the enemy cannot stop it. An empowered church. I'm going to get through them. A faith church. A faith church. Only one I know come to faith. Come on, faith. This is our miracle baby. That's why our name's Faith. Stand over there by Drew. Her name is Faith, but that's the reason it's named Faith. I probably should have got Amber to come on up here because she believes in anything. When I'm doubting, she's believing. 
She says it's going to happen. I said, that's not going to happen. I'll never forget in Mount Airy when God removed a five-pound mass out of her stomach. She came home to the preacher and said, it's gone. I said, let me feel. God's wanting to raise up a church that believes God for anything. What did the angel tell Mary when he showed up and he said, you're going to have a kid? The angel said that with God, all things are possible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But if you want to please God, you got to know who he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You must ask and believe. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. God wants to build a church church that is built on faith in Jesus Christ the third church God is wanting to build not only does he want to build a whosoever church but God wants to build an empowered church God wants to build a faith church sanctified church sanctified church what's that mean what what does a sanctified church mean It just means that you're purified. You're set apart. You're holy. Now, 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 we we, we chased a lot of rabbit trails talking about holiness because I don't know if holiness is so much about what you got dressed with, it's what you got filled with. Why don't you come up here, Willie Ham? Come on. I love this guy too. Used to play some basketball with him. He's a bruiser. You couldn't knock him out of the lane. He wants a sanctified church. Not, well, your shirt's not tucked in. In fact, you don't have a suit on. But that don't mean you're not sanctified. Ladies, you don't have dress, but that don't mean you're not sanctified. I've seen the most sanctimonious people with the best church clothes on that have a spirit of Jezebel. But let me tell you this, sanctification starts on the inside. And when God saves you and when the Lord catches you, all of a sudden the Spirit of God begins to work inside of you and that word just simply means you are set apart. It means that now you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar people and you have been called out of darkness and now you are in His marvelous light and when people at school see you, when people at work see you, they look at you and say there's something. Have you ever had anybody just look at you and say there's something different about those people they don't do what I do they don't act like I act there's something different about them I need you now right up there <clears throat> can I add can, I'm going to put you in that section okay from, from here to here You don't, you two don't answer. Okay, you'll find out. Who's the oldest person? (laughs) Now you know, right? Who's the oldest person? Well, I know that. I don't want them to answer. How old are you, Tanner? 29. Wish I was 29. Oh, she don't want to answer. We'll say Tommy then. Who's the youngest? Is it Tobias? How old is he? 22 months. You know that's a mom that's hanging on to that as long as she can. Because if that had been a man, she'd have, he'd have said, he'd say, he's two years old. God is not only building a faith church, empowered church, whosoever church, a sanctified church, but he's wanting to build an ageless church. See, we got it wrong. You don't have to be of a certain age before you get saved. You don't have to be of a certain age before you get used by God. God says, come unto me all who are heavy laden. And he wants to use the young and he wants to use the old. Let me tell you, church, the only way you're going to grow is that you got to start getting some young folks in this church. And my heart is blessed when you look at this section of four rows and you see it full of people that are 30 years and under because that's the church that God is wanting to get in. He's not wanting to just rely on those that have 
been here for so many years. In fact, I've been reading in Jeremiah. And when he talked to Jeremiah, he said, I know that you are a young boy. And he said, don't you look at their faces because they're going to despise you. But I knew you before you were even out of your mother's womb. Let me tell you, God wants to use the young people and the old people and he wants to mesh them together because that's the church that he wants to build. An ageless church. Let me tell you that if we don't have young people in the church, the church will eventually die. That if Jesus does not return in the next 30 years, we better see an influx of young people falling in love with Jesus, not falling in in love with lights, not falling in love with technology or media, but falling in love with the precious Son of God, the one that was a Nazarene, that was born of a Virgin Mary. We must fall in love with Jesus. Y'all can be seated. He's building a church, Drew. He's building a church. He's building a church. He's building a whosoever church, an empowered church, a faith church, a sanctified church, an ageless church. But he's building it upon the rock. This rock walks through fire. The Old Testament is full of theophanies. That simply means that Jesus popped up in the Old Testament. And I believe one of those was when he ended up in the fiery furnace. And they threw them boys into that furnace so hard it burnt up the men that threw them. And then Nebuchadnezzar looked in there and said something's going on because I see one that looks like the Son of Man. Let me tell you this. This rock walks through fires. This, wa- this rock walks on water. This rock conquers death. This rock consoles the grieving. This rock provides victory to the battle. This rock is powerful. He doesn't say, I wish I had a rock. I know I gotta, I gotta close this, but I wish I had a rock to just sit down right here because it's different being by a rock than being built on a rock. It's different being on a rock than it is to be under a rock. And the Bible, Jesus says that upon this rock I will build my church. He didn't say by this rock. He didn't say under this rock. He said upon the very rock which is his name, Jesus Christ. And upon that rock, let me tell you about this church, that when you are going through times that you don't know how you're going to get through it. There used to be an old song that we sung up in these choir laws and it said, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. This rock that we are built upon, not only will it be strong but it will lift us above every trial and every problem that we face it's my mom's birthday and I remember at night she probably remembers this when I was scared I still am scared and and, and I would run to that room and I would I I don't even know if I would knock on the door and daddy was asleep he didn't care and I would say mom I'm scared. She didn't make me sit in the floor. She didn't make me, she didn't make me get a pallet and put it, but she lifted me up and she put me in that bed and she lifted every care and every concern and this rock that the church is built upon it will lift you up hey if you will allow him to be your savior and to be the foundation of your life I don't care what storm you go through you can have the winds and the waves roaring and it can seem like he's sleeping on the job but when you get the attention of the master he'll show up and he'll say peace be still Has anybody ever felt that before? Has anybody ever experienced that? When nothing else could help, love lifted me. This rock not only walks through fire, this rock not only lifts me up, oh, this rock conquers death and it steadies every place that I go. It preserves me. 
and what it is building will not fail. There's a lot of things that will fail. But what God is building won't fail. I remember we got a, a dog, first dog we ever got. I'm, we were happy. I've been begging Amber for, for a dog, and she finally let me have it. And um, the kids were excited. We, 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 were, we were ecstatic. But at that time, it had to be an outside dog. Now we have an inside dog. But at that time, it had to be an outside dog. You remember this, Amber? And we, we, we got the idea up, Bobo, let's build a dog house. It was an utter failure. I didn't know about 45 degree angles. I didn't know about pitches on a roof. I didn't know about the opening up of a dog house. I just said I built it with the scrap wood that I got. I think the dog got more rain inside the dog house than he did outside, in, outside the dog house. It was an utter, utter failure. But when Jesus looks at Peter and says not only am I going to build this upon the rock not only is it going to lift you up not only are you going to be steadied when life is rocking not only are you going to be preserved from the cares of this world but what I am building you can rest assured it is not going to fail your doghouse might fail they might strike your building with lightning and have to tear it down to the slabs your tire on your car may burn out and blow out but there is one thing that will never fail and that's the church that the Lord Jesus Christ is building they can tell me not to preach in Jesus name they can take Jesus out of the schoolhouse but Jesus' church will never fail hey you ever built something like that I always Oh my goodness, it was pitiful. It was terrible. But let me tell you about this church. It is the very vice versa. The world looks at it and says they're pitiful. They're pathetic. They're weak. But we have a God in heaven that has given us an eternal hope that tells me no matter what comes my way, I have a hope that is steadfast and secure. I have an anchor and it shall endure. And that anchor is Christ Jesus. And I'm closing. The last thing he says, he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Now, gates symbolize entrance. Get this. Gates symbolize entrance. And everything that the gates surround you own, right? You don't put a gate around your property that you don't own. That would be silly. You put a gate and a wall around what you own. Hell boasts of a lot of things. They lie to God's people and, and, and hell lies to God's people and says you can't do this. You can't accomplish this. You're too young. You're not the right color. You're not the right pedigree. You don't have enough strength. You're not clean enough. I remember what you did. Everything inside the gates of hell presents lies. And they come after God's people. And Jesus said, but the church that is built upon the rock, whatever is inside the gates of hell will not prevail. God help me. The Old Testament gives us little shadows of this. 
He gives us, uh, it gives us a little bit of uh, a foreshadowing of what is going to happen. The same spirit that went to David and said, I'll kill you. David reared back and slung the stone and slayed Goliath. The same spirit that told Daniel, you'll go into the lion's den and you'll be devoured. That's the same spirit that will come after the church in these days that we live in. That will say you cannot prevail. You will not accomplish. You're just, you're just in Thorn, Mississippi. Your outreach is not going to reach where you want it to go. But let me tell you, the church that God is building, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Whatever is on the inside of those gates, no matter how big their Goliaths are, no matter how vast their lions are, no matter how vast their army and their intelligence is, it does not matter because we are built upon the rock. And don't you ever forget it. That rock steadies you, stabilizes you, lifts you carries you who is he to you today who is he is he a fable fairy tale for me he's the son of God he's awesome and he's my savior I am founded on the rock and the church that he's building will not be defeated stand with me